see myself. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another Blake Society event. Um, do join the Blake Society. There are many wonderful advantages. And uh, one is that you can get fantastic copy of Vela. You can have it in digital form or in hard copy form like this one. And uh, as you can see, it's full of fascinating articles book reviews, William Blake, taxi driver. <clears throat> it's absolutely got the lot. So please do uh, join the Blake Society and, um, and make, the, uh, make the most of that uh, opportunity, which uh, I really highly recommend to you. Um, tonight, we're looking at um, Milton. It's a continuation of our frontispiece uh, series, and um, we are going to um, we're going to uh, just have a discussion around that. And I'm going to fill in a few gaps uh, around the uh, background to Milton and to its composition in Felpham. So please do turn your cameras on so that uh, you can participate in the discussion if you'd like to. That's wonderful. And first slide, please, Ian. And this is our first slide, um, the first edition of uh, Milton's Paradise Lost was um, actually in 1667. And uh, it was 10 books. This is the first illustrated edition from 1688. And uh, as we can see, it's to justify the ways of God to men, uh, which of course was the, the, the famous line that, uh, that Milton attached to this poem in 12 books by this time. I had to study two for A-level. Does anybody wish to comment on this frontispiece for us? Ah. Okay. Yeah, so I'm not actually able to see anybody else at the moment on my screen. <clears throat> yeah, perhaps somebody could speak to me to reassure me that I can be heard. Yes, we can hear you. Can Excellent, you good. Hi there. Right. So back to the frontispiece. If there's no comments on that, I'll move on to the first slide, which is the frontispiece or title page, and it's both of Milton itself. Um, and we'll see that uh, Blake picks up at the bottom uh, the line to justify the ways of uh, God to men. And uh, Henry Crabb Robinson reports Blake saying of Milton, I have seen him, I've seen him, sorry, as a youth and as an old man with a long flowing beard. He came lately as an old man. He said, he came to ask a favor of me. He said he had committed an error in his paradise lost, which he wanted me to correct in a poem or picture, but I declined. I said I had my own duties to perform. I love that line of Blake that Milton asks you to correct an error that you've made in Paradise Lost. And he says, I'm sorry, I've got my own duties to perform. Crab Robinson questions what that could be that Milton asked him to do, the error. 
And Blake replies, it is presumptuous, sir. Uh, Blake replies, he wished me to expose the falsehood of his doctrine, taught in his paradise lost, that sexual intercourse arose out of the fall. Now that cannot be, for no good can spring out of evil. But I replied, if the consequence were evil mixed with good, that the good might be ascribed to the common cause. To this he answered by a reference to the androgynous state in which I could not possibly follow him. At the time that he asserted his own possession of this gift of vision, he did not boast of it as peculiar to himself. All men might have it if they would. And the reference there, I think, to the androgynous state is uh, an extraordinary one and lends itself to uh, Blake's idea of the human as um, possessing both sexes. And we're going to see a lot of uh, stuff about gender and identity fluidity uh, in Milton. We also see on the, uh, on the frontispiece uh, the author and printer, William Blake, uh, 1804. And that's the date that he put on the title page of Milton and Jerusalem. This was actually uh, printed in 1811. And 1804, of course, is the year that Blake returns to London after uh, three years in Felpham. And the poem will very much be placed in that Felpham context, um, as we will see. Blake also uh, is doing something here with Milton's name. It's split into Mill and Tun. And um, he describes it as a poem in 12 books. In some copies, this is copy C, the one is hidden in the, in the little circle that surrounds it. Uh, you can go there with the pointer, Ian. And, yep, stuff a bit there. <laughs> That's it. And, uh, yeah. And in fact, of course, the poem is, uh, is in two books and not uh, at all in, in 12. And so whether it was Blake's intention to originally have 12 books or whether he is uh, just mirroring uh, Milton's work uh, in that assertion of 12, uh, we cannot know. But two books, two books is what it is. <clears throat> now, this this piece or title page represents a real departure in the method of printing, the method of engraving that, uh, that Blake is using. Would anyone like to comment on the frontispiece or title page and the significance of it? Tim. We're just opening it up to a discussion Tim. among all of ourselves. Um, in terms of modern graphics, Blake has done something really outrageous. He split the title of Mill and Ton into two parts. And one wonders why he did that. Um, it could be for the layout, but I suspect it's more that in some sense, the image is breaking up the logos, the word. So he's doing something fundamental in splitting the world into words and images and the image is dominant. And Ramazan has his hand raised. It looks like um, <coughs> it's written on clouds. Um, that's, that's what always fascinated me. Uh, it looks like it's uh, clouds of thought, as Blake would put it. So um, as Milton is waving his hand, is in a sense, I think, splitting that cloud. Um, so I don't know why he would do um, one horizontally and one vertically but still I think this is really interesting image absolutely Ramazan yes I couldn't agree more um John hello <laughs> popped up just Hi, um, just building on what both um Tim and Ramazan were saying um I suppose if if in some if part of what Blake is doing in Milton is 
uh, correcting a, a fault that he saw in Milton or uh, as a as an artist and as a man. Well, in that image there, he's literally rearranging the word Milton. You know, he's, he's literally uh, recombobulating it, if that can be a word. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that's that's very, uh, very much the case. And it's a very different treatment to um, the front of the speech. Uh, not sure that background noise is there. It's rather extreme, isn't it? Uh, forgive me if I seem slightly discombobulated at the start. It's because I had an unstable connection. So I've now actually moved, moved my location. Um, Peter Dodd has a raised hand. Peter, where are you? Peter is muted. So. Ah. You're muted, Peter. Dear, that will never do, Peter. There you are, Peter. Speak to us. Peter, you're muted. <laughs> right. Peter, we can't hear you. No. Nope. Dear, oh dear, I think Peter's got some uh, some connection problems there. No, nope, can't hear him. Sure. Uh, I think um, absolutely right about the, the sort of correction of Milton. It's as though he's broken Milton effectively, isn't it, in some sense. And um, I think the, uh, the commentators and editors of the, of the lovely big tape gallery book um, of Milton suggest that uh, there's some significance in the splitting of mill with its association of satanic mills and so on, although it's only one L, and the ton sort of heavily dragging down the, the page there. Ramazan's very right about the, um, about the smoke, and it's, it's coming from fire. Uh, in some copies, so this is copy C, which you can see at Milton's feet. Of course, for Blake, that can be very associated with energy rather than uh, anything in the way of a con conventional, conventional hell that, that are rather book-like, almost as though Milton could be entering a book. Um, and I think that's, that's a possibility. And the raised right hand, of course, and the... the rights and lefts in this hex be important. Um, it's a shame that we can't hear Peter. Susan Blake has her hand raised though. And uh, Susan. Hi there, I'm new to the Blake Society and I come to it from a linguistic perspective and so I was wondering whether or not um, the breaking of Milton into two parts actually has to do with the prosody. So notice it's two syllables. We're dealing with a work of poetics. Mm -hmm. um, I just was interested uh, to note that there are two syllables there and whether that was um, in perhaps some way significant as well. Um, but I defer to those of you that know Blake's work uh, better. Um, I'm glad to join you. I'm coming to you from uh, the west coast of Canada. Wow. Uh, yeah, and so uh, I'm excited to hear what you have to say. That's brilliant, Susan. Welcome from the west coast of Canada. Is that Vancouver? Thank you so much. Yes, I'm, a, I'm in Vancouver, but I'm actually on Vancouver Island right now. I've taken my work to the wilds of the west coast for a few days, and so I'm um, glad to be here. Lovely. It's lovely, lovely to have you. There's, there's a lot in this text about 
splitting of identities and merging of identities. And I think what we're seeing is a lot to do with that. And there's a, a later plate in which um, another word is actually being split. So that it follows down the text in that way. And um, I think, yeah, I think John's right in terms of the correction of the, of, of the error. I think something has to perhaps be broken before it can be fixed. And I think Milton perhaps sets out to do that in this, in this text. Any comment on this um, style of engraving? Um, I've, got some, uh, I've got some notes from Blake's notebook about what he's working with here, um, which we can look at if there's no further. Uh... Um, Jennifer has her hand raised. Oh, right. As does Milton. <laughs> Absolutely. Jennifer. Yeah, yeah thank you. Uh, um, uh, when we're talking about the cloud, uh, this, of course, there's so many identities possible here in this figure. Yeah. With the with the uh, pillar of, of of cloud, fire and cloud. Um, you know, wondering if one of those identities might be Moses, mm -hmm. uh, with possibly the at his left hand. You know, that image of uh, sort of hidden there, but a, a, a tablets, the stone tablets. Of course, he's put his own name on it. That's, that's yeah. brilliant. And we, we do see some stone tablets again later on uh, in another yeah. split, split word context. Yes. So that would really tie up. Isn't there a thing about, uh, are you referencing the business of the um, Israelites following the cloud by day and the fire by night and yes. Moses in the yes. burning bush as well? So, so the whole Exodus theme, right, for this, mm. for this book would be, would be relevant. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Brilliant. Any more hands raised? Can you hear me? No? Oh, yes. Is that yes. Peter? Oh, it's Gary. All right. Okay. Well, <clears throat> are you only going to show this particular printing of, of the title page, or are there others to come? I do have another. Yeah, because some of them, it seems to be that Blake has shown the smoke or whatever it was as actually emerging from Milton's hands. Right. And, well, um, Nelson Hilton picked this up many years ago, and he sees a resemblance to um, an alchemical work. I don't know if you can see it if I put up. Can you see? Oh, goodness. How do I? Uh, yeah. Just about. Uh, just about. Okay. So we're talking alchemy. We're talking. I don't think we're talking alchemy so much as. Well, this particular book, Michael Myers, Atalanta Fujians, belonged to Blake's friend, Alexander Tiller. And Tiller had an extensive alchemical library, but Atalanta Fugians seems to me to give lots and lots of hints to Blake for graphic designs. Mm. Um, and that, that, that's the image that the, um, Nelson, Nelson Hilton picks up, this idea of the smoke coming out of their hands. But there's another aspect of smoke coming out of hands. Um, you know, I, I'm obsessed with the early collectors, so as well, I'm friends with Blake. So as well as uh, Tiller, his earliest identifiable collector is Rebecca Bliss. And she was immensely interested in Indian art, mm -hmm. not only collected Mughal miniatures and the rest, but also had lots of books on India. And in one of them I've looked at, which is a... Um, book on Hindu rites, and it's appropriate this time of year. It's a, an image showing uh, Darga Puja, main festival of Hinduism, where the devotees show their devotion to the goddess by holding 
burning incense in their mm-hmm. hands. Mm-hmm. So I, I don't know. It's it's another image that goes into it, which may be, I don't know what it what it implies. If when I look at the image of the Durga Puja, I see this, but maybe other people wouldn't. Um, but it's it's just the feeling that there's that Milton is the source of. Uh, the clouds of steam or smoke. Does that make sense to anybody? Um, I, ha- I haven't really thought through. It. It just, I'm just thinking of, I'm not the only person who's seen certainly Michael Meyer in, in Blake. Uh, Nelson Hilton has seen his work mm-hmm. in Blake. Susan Sklar. Little Page Kerry. Yeah. Mm. Okay. I think even in, in this particular version of the title page, if you look at it that way, one can see the fire is issuing from his feet and the and the yeah. smoke from his hand. It's hmm. the contact, isn't it? Really, it's it's it's, it's what's flowing out of out of where. Hmm. Um, okay. This position is a position that we see in other uh, sort of grave entering and sort of ex- hmm. in, in other in other uh, figures in Blake. Um, it's a threshold pose, I feel, isn't it? Before he's, yeah. before he actually steps into another, into another realm. But that's fascinating in terms of both the alchemical and the Indian uh, connection, and that these things were known to known to Blake. And so mm. this is a text in which I think al- alchemy can very much be present. There are a lot of uh, fusions, of sacred marriages going on, um, unions between individuals. Uh, and one maybe could follow the alchem- alchemical process of um, uh, Negredo and Albedo through it. it it's all possible to be looking out for the blacks, the whites, and the reds. I think the like color coding. I have. We do have another title page. Whether it will um, do the business uh, that you describe, you know, in terms of, of the ones you're thinking of, the smoke issue more clearly from Milton. Uh, we'll see. I can't tell you offhand, actually. I, I put it in for another purpose, just to show the colour variations and so on. Three participants have their hands raised. And um, I'll try and see who they are. I'm not getting them right to the top. Wilson, I've got here. Andy. Is that for me, Stephen? I can't Yeah. Remember. Yeah, okay, thank you. Yeah, two things. Um, <clears throat> I was a few minutes late joining, so I apologise if this one's already been mentioned. Uh, but like David Erdman, I'm struck by the symmetry between this and the following page in Milton, which seem to mirror each other if you look at it a certain way. And where here in, the, in, the, in this frontispiece you have Milton, from Milton's point of view, um, mm-hmm. surrounded by fire and clouds of prophetic wrath, as he dives into the world of time and space. Uh, and then that's mirrored on the other side by Milton as a star, Milton seen from the point of view of the world, entering the world of time and space. Mm-hmm. Um, but with regard to what Kerry said a moment ago, I'll just mention that at our last meeting, I can't help but be reminded of how our last meeting ended with Ian Sinclair talking about his time in Peru. And for those who weren't there, he was was talking about his new book in the context of the influence Mm. of Blake's The Mental Traveller on him. And um, he said that that the the moment in Peru, specifically when The Mental Traveller came came to mind to him for whatever reason was when he was talking to the old woman who brought out some fire and burned the fire and he said as he was talking to her the moment that really struck him was when it seemed that these sticks that she was holding were giving off smoke and all of a sudden they started giving up a lot a lot more smoke and the smoke started coming through her nostrils as well and all of a sudden they were there was a lot more smoke than the sticks themselves would have justified, and he, he, he saw this as a reference to 
um, the uh, traditional beliefs of the Ashaninka people, of which this woman was one, and their belief in their fire god. And um, I just thought that nicely mirrored Kerry's point. Very nicely. Thank you, Andy. That's brilliant. Uh, Tim has his hand raised, I believe. Just in quick support of Kerry's Indian reference, it is almost a Krishna image, Krishna being the dispeller of darkness. Mm. Mm. And the, just the colouring of this image, it is that idea of a guru, someone who dispels the darkness, and a very sort of almost androgynous Krishna image. Wonderful. Ramazan. I was thinking of something else. Um, it's here as if Milton is walking away from uh, his book because to justify the ways of uh, God to man is written uh, down his feet. It's as if he's stamping the stony low to lo dust because paradise lost in a way set, uh, low, set a low to stone for the Christian world. So he's stamping it to dust. And if we look at his face, he is sad, he is upset about it. So he wants it to be um, corrected. That's why he is entering the world um, in self-annihilation. So mm -hmm. the fire is self-annihilation, maybe. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, they justify moving into the picture away from it, Ramazan. That's very true. There's a sort of theatricality to quite a lot of Blake's pictures. And of course, Milton is, is doing what generally actors advise not to do, which is turning his back to his audience, um, which is interesting in, its, in itself. I think the, say the ghost of a flea, which is actually on a little stage um, with curtains, and you can see, see the boards being trod. If we just, oh, there's another hand raised from Emma Johnson. Hi, Emma. Hi, can you hear me? Oh, yes. Oh, great. That's great. Um, so this image, a few things came to me as I was listening to everybody and, and looking at this image, which is an amazing image. Um, so I illustrate myself. I, I, I come from a point of view of a poet and an artist, uh, looking and an admirer of Blake. And I look at this and a few things came out of this. Um, when you illustrate something like Blake, it, it, it illustrates other people's work. So he, in a way, he, he remakes them, he breaks them, he reinterprets them, um, he remodels them. What you do is you, you reveal something about that work that perhaps was kept secret or unknown. So it comes back to me to that feeling of revelation, the, you know, you look beyond the black, the smoke, whatever is around there and, and something's coming through, the light is coming through, whether that's fire or whether that's knowledge or whether that's energy, it's coming through. So in a way, whilst this is of, of Milton, I also see Blake in this image as well, as someone who through his reinterpretation reveals something to us with his, you know, with that fierce energy that he has. Um, and I think that's, you know, extraordinary really, because a lot of Blake's works obviously return to revelation, you know, the act of something, making something known that was secret. And I really see that in this image here. And I think it's extraordinary because that break as well, I mean, I would just say the audacity of Blake, which he's putting himself in the context of, of those that came before him. It's almost like he already knows how great he is because, you know, to, to split the name of an intellectual giant like Milton, you know, someone, a giant of literature, um, only, you know, only someone like Blake could really do that. For most people would see that as completely, you know, you can't do that, you can't do that to Milton, but that's pure Blake to me. So I think this, this vision, it works on so many levels, but it's just so Blake and that's, I love that about Blake. He's <laughs> so audacious. <laughs> no, who would do it? Who would actually do that to Milton? Not many, but that's pure Blake. And I think he sees himself already, as in, as in that line, you know, the true inheritor, of, of, you know, he will be a giant himself one day. I think he already has an idea, I think. So that's mm. all came through to me. That's, that's really lovely, Emma. Thank you. Yeah, who would have the audacity to say to Milton, oh, sorry, I can't <laughs> help you, Milton. He said, I have my own <laughs> duties to perform. <laughs> 
But he said that in uh, to Crab Robinson in uh, 1825, and to some extent he'd done it already completely in this in this poem. Uh, I'm, some commentators think that it's sort of Blake and Milton. Um, Blake, we often see the sort of some of the lineaments of Blake's fate in it, and. Uh, I, you know, there is that sense perhaps a fusion has already occurred. It certainly will later in the poem. Lloyd. Hi, everyone. Can I just say, I wish I had back definition like this guy. Really, really good. Um, I see it almost like a blackboard. Do you see how he could be wiping away on a blackboard the, the notion of Milton? Um, and you use the word revealing and revealing underneath whatever it is that Milton has written before what Blake is about to write. Uh, so, and also I noticed the, the positioning of the feet is one of motion. So it isn't just some guy standing there, it's someone walking or about to walk, about to enter, about to go through. Um, but also, I, I just like the this right right arm. Um, I'm channeling my dad as a school teacher, and I, I can I can just see him now rubbing out loads of um, stuff on uh, on blackboards. Um, yeah, so that's my take on it. Yes, I, I think that might relate to the um, to the. The method that he's used as well. One, it's like white lines on a on a black background, um, and he just he describes this in the um, in the in the notebook. I think Tim's got his up again. Just really a follow up to Emma Johnson's point and a challenge to her: if she was going to do a book about Blake, how could she deconstruct? Blake, bearing in mind that Blake has already done this to Milton. What further stage is um, Blake challenged that he's laying down to other people in design? How could you do a frontispiece to a book called Blake, which was even more challenging than this one? Well, I guess Tim would take up that challenge. I actually do have the idea for an illustration about Blake that's milling around in my head at the moment that Henry Bess is actually going to help me with from the from the group from the Facebook group so I do have that in my mind how would I rise that challenge takes audacity um, takes the humble roots that perhaps Blake had I have humble roots so I think nothing to lose um, I would it's a kind of alchemy illustration and creation so I think I'd place Blake through the lens, I'd place it through a modern lens and see, and see what I came out with. I can't tell you what I'd come out with, but I can tell you now that when I'm creating, I do not know what journey I'm going on. But at the end, something amazing does come out. So I, I would just go fiercely and bravely on that journey. And if I was brave enough, I might present it to this group at some point. But um, it's I can't explain. I can't explain the process of creation like, like Blake, like Milton. I just can't explain it. I just know it's a journey. You go on it. Sometimes it works out. Sometimes it doesn't. But um, yeah, I, I, would, um, I would just place him through, the, through a modern lens. And I think he'd come out rather well, Blake, because he was so of that time, but of this time, fiercely, fiercely, um, that fierce creative energy that he had, that crucible, I think, translates well to today. So I... I would pick up that challenge, definitely. Just to say Stephen's reconnecting, so please do uh, continue the, the discussion without him. He'll be right back with us any minute now. So Tim, I don't know if you could just take over chairing duties in Stephen's absence, thanks. Certainly, I see Andy Wilson's got a question. Andy. Yeah, it is a question for someone who knows the uh, history of you know Blake's technique and things like that. Could, could someone comment on you know, the engraving here, which seems very different to his normal style. I think that's already been been pointed out. But what strikes me about it, um, every time I look at it, is that Blake is often going on about the, the necessity of firm outline and how much he hates blotching and shading and things like that. And then all of a sudden, all over here, he's got all this cross-hatch shading, which is, which is sort of unusual 
for him and and for me sort of sits slightly at odds with what, what he normally goes yeah, on back in the room that was an open question for anyone who, who who knows about it kerry would you like to answer that um yeah technically it's it's a kind of very complicated process that he developed you know, he was in Jerusalem with the famous uh, crucifixion, where he's, if I'm reading it correctly, he's created a relief etched plate, which is probably the figure of Milton himself, and then worked over the, the engraving the lines into the relief etched plate. Yeah, that's what he's done. So. Normally, when you create an Italio engraving, the lines of Milton and of the, the smoke would have printed black, but he's cut them into his relief edge plate where he prints the surface black and the engraved lines are printing as white. Mm. Oh, it's, uh, it's, it's virtuosic in, in engraving. I mean, the, the, even the... Uh, and you see the, the cross hatching on, on Milton's body is crossed white lines, whereas it's usually crossed black lines. So it's, a, it's an amazing achievement hmm. in the engraving and the printing. How you can print that plate without disaster, I, 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 I am amazed. <laughs> um, I'd say one, oh, something else occurred to me. People talking about um, Exodus, kind of the pillar of cloud, the pillar of fire. Every time I see a retreating male newt, I think of Moses' vision of Jehovah, because all Moses sees of Jehovah are the back parts of God. Mm -hmm. So Christians believe that they will see God face to face, as opposed to the Jews who just see God from the back retreating. Um, to me, it's, you know, Jehovah's great wobbly bottom going off into the distance. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> it's, so is, is Milton God? Is Blake's vision Moses' vision? Oh, no. I, I, am I going down absurd? Uh, territory here. Yeah. Not at all, Kerry. I mean, as far as Blake's concerned, we, we're all God, aren't we? Uh, as, okay. Again, he says to Crab Robinson mm. when he asks him if he thinks he's um, if he's God, if he's Jesus, and he says, yes, and so are you, and yeah. so are you. <laughs> um, if we could just, because uh, taking you up on that, Kerry, if we can go to the next uh, slide, Ian. Jason, Sorry about a... my instability there. This is from the notebook, uh, which of course was Robert's notebook that Blake, uh, Blake took over. And um, he describes the, this is the method that apparently he used in this. Um, and this, what we were just looking at is wood cut on copper, the second one. You lay a ground as for etching, trace instead of etching the blacks, etch the whites and bite it in. Um, other plates in Milton are wood cut on pewter, so he's mixed the two. And those are the ones that have the sort of sense of luminosity coming out of, uh, out of the, the figures. There's halos around um, the, the, the figure of, of Milton taking off the robe of the promise in a, in a later plate. So does that all make sense, Kerry? Yes, yeah, um, I've forgotten about this wood cut on copper because... Yeah, you etch the whites and bite it in, but then you have to print very lightly from the surface of, of the copper plate and not use the intense pressure that, that, that you'd normally uh, apply to etch the blacks. Ah, um, I'd like to see somebody try and do it. <laughs> That's all I could say. Yeah. You, yeah, it's it's such light pressure as required. Would he even have done it on a 
uh, on on a on a on a on a press. Um, or what do you have done it with the back of a spoon? Um, mm -hmm. I'm just amazed by it. Mm -hmm. The more I look at it, the more baffled and amazed I am. Absolutely. Um, the Robert's notebook here, um, of course, as far as Blake was concerned, Robert had brought to him the method of printing and etching. And it's all written in the, in the notebook that, uh, that, Robert, uh, that Robert left after, after his death. Um, and of course, Blake writes to William Haley to comfort him um, about the, the loss of his son and to uh, commiserate with him and says, uh, I lost a brother with his spirit. I converse daily and hourly, see him in rem remembrance in the regions of my imagination. I hear his advice and even now write for, from his dictate. Um, and that sort of, I think helps to seal the deal. And Blake moves to Felpham where Milton is situated uh, as a poem um, and it's very much uh, a happy thing initially for the Blakes and um, London has become a sort of anathema to them uh, and, and off they go. Tim is it worth me just reading a little bit about the yeah. Could you call Jason, who's had his hand up for a while? Oh, I beg your pardon. Yeah, I'm not getting... No, don't worry, don't worry, don't <laughs> worry. Jason, please I, do come in. Yes, I, I just wanted to draw attention to... Um, drawing attention to the Blake's technique for white line relief etching. Mm. Um, of course, bear in mind that this was a period he was experimenting with this quite widely. And, of course, it created considerable disasters for Blake when um, he was working on Blair's The Grave. And he used a very similar technique for Death's Door, which an early impression mm. of which Chromex saw and went basically, there's no way we're publishing that. <laughs> um, at which point he brings in Shea Benetti to, um, to, to produce it in much more conventional techniques. But Joe Viscomi has an awful lot to say on this kind of white line um, relief etching technique. I was just trying to look up and forgive me, it's been, it's been a long day, so I'm a little bit tired here. So I'm just gonna keep this brief, but, but I mean, Kerry's comments about the sheer technical complexity of trying to print this. Um, it was something that, you know, Blake's contemporaries, when they saw early variants of this, they were kind of, they didn't know how to read the images. So that's very clear with Cromack when he sees that, that the early state impression for their store from the grave. Um, and, and, and I just wanted to echo Kerry's points that, that, that the sheer technical virtuosity of what Blake is trying to do um, in his technique is just astonishing. And actually a really nice one to draw people's attention to again, um, The House of the Interpreter, which is a late, almost, you know, a, a little um, aperitif that he produces towards the end of his life is another wonderful demonstration, you know, sort of just drawing attention against to Blake's sheer inventiveness in the medium of printing um, and techniques. So I just wanted to kind of just Mm -hmm. Just draw attention to the fact that, that we're kind of still discussing this a couple of hundred years later. Blake's contemporaries did not know how to read these images. It, it, it threw them completely at odds in terms of simply interpreting those designs. Absolutely. I believe, Jason, that, that some of them would have thought of it as very sort of primitive, rough. and Yes, I, I mean, it's, it's actually interesting. I mean, for me personally, I find lots of echoes of the kind of stuff that he did for um, the Virgil woodcuts at the end of his life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and again, people just didn't know how to read those images. Um, <laughs> and, and, and it's always a, a sheer pleasure for me in, in Blake's craft that, you know, the, the, his techniques of engraving, his techniques of visual experimentation <laughs> completely throw contemporary readers out. They, they just don't know how to interpret those, mm. those illustrations. So true. And the woodcuts, the Virgil's ecologues and such, are very dark and very beautiful. And of course, he calls this method woodcut, um, albeit on metal. But uh, that's really interesting. Um, Diane Eagles has her hand raised. Hi. Um, hi, Diane. I've, hi, I've been listening with interest. I, I can't say I've spent a lot of time looking at this image before, but I 
did originally do printmaking and and it is a very complex process in itself and it just made me think about how um, everything has to be reversed to print but to do a, a kind of wood engraving onto metal you're kind of doing a double reversal like you said to try and print a white line you're actually having to reverse a process that is already a reversed process of printing so there's a strange kind of double reversal in trying to produce an image like that and I was just thinking how complex that is and why would you do that if it weren't to try and say something about the image itself so I was trying to then link that with some of the earlier discussions about how the figure moves through the smoke and into this unknown realm if you like and so I was looking again at the figure and how it, although it's moving through, the head is actually looking to the side. And it made me think about somebody who's blind or traveling through smoke and how you have to feel your way. You're not seeing the way, you're going with your uh, a bodily emotional experience. But again, I'm wondering if there's something with that strange removal in the printing process and the removal of the character into a very um, unexplored realm as the printing takes it into a very unexplored and new area. That's kind of where I was going. <laughs> into, yeah, my own unexplored area. That's, yeah, that's, that's fascinating. Shall we go to the page that Andy has already referred to that faces? The, uh, the title page or frontispiece. And there's the, the star that uh, the comet of Milton. So in a poem, so much about time and space and the moment. And again, Essek and Viscomi comment in this poem, time travel is not only possible, but inevitable. <laughs> so Doctor Who eat your heart out. Um, identity and fusion we've already discussed and that's so much characteristic of this poem. Milton exists in three places simultaneously. And the poems both cosmic and domestic, these vast uh, universal things happening. And Blake himself is in this poem. He's actually there as, as Blake. Catherine is there referred to, we don't see her. And it's all in happening in the cottage and the garden uh, in Felpham when we actually reach generation, when we reach our world. Um, and it's, it's all happening in a sense simultaneously. An eternal bard sings a song that inspires Milton to descend to champion art and replace corporeal war. He was so compromised by his, um, his working for Cromwell effectively to replace corporeal war with mental flight, fight and reclaim his emanation Olalon, his feminine part who he sees scattered through the depths. Again, I think um, Essek and Viscomi say that you can summarize Milton in, in, uh, in two parts, that uh, Milton sees Olalon in, down in the Ulro and, and goes down to reclaim his, his feminine portion. And part two, Olalon sees uh, Milton down in the Ulro and goes down to, to join him, to save him. Well, that's a ridiculous simplification of what is an extraordinary complex poem, but that is, is basically the, the movements of it. Um, Milton's uh, feminine part is embodied by Milton's three wives and three daughters. And I just struck by how contemporary Blake's thinking is. It's Olalon is a she, a they, and an it. She's, she's a river. She's a community of people living by that river. And when she manifests in, in Blake's uh, garden, she's a 12 year old virgin. So she's all those, all those things at once. 
Would we like to look at this one and talk about the page that faces the frontispiece we've just been talking about? Uh, it very much summarizes in the, in the second paragraph, as it were, after the division about, uh, about Milton going to claim his emanation. What about this as a facing page to the frontispiece? And Ramazan. Okay, uh, I think the figures lying down um, below Milton book the first uh, look like Adam and Eve. Mm -hmm. They are, in a sense, Milton's creation and his greatest work. So uh, I think he's going through his own imaginative um, world as well going through his uh, imaginative universe as well. But in a sense, when a comet or a star goes, it usually goes down. When a comet is going, it usually goes down, but Milton is going up. So in this sense, uh, Blake probably um, rearranged the compass points uh, for us because it is not the world of time and space yet. Milton is still going through the imaginative world. So he is going upside which looks to us downwards, if it makes sense. Yeah, that make, makes perfect sense to me. And we've got the sort of ears of, um, of wheat on the left-hand side of the plate and, and bunches of grapes on the other. And that, um, I believe, references the harvest and the vintage with which, uh, with which the, the, the poem ends. And of course, we get a lot of the four Zoas coming into uh, into Milton and Jerusalem, and I think he he certainly started it, and uh, I was continuing it in Felpham, um, and a lot of it is is just well, not a lot of it, but lines and whole sections are moved wholesale into into Milton. Um, his figures are foot to foot an interesting way. This, of course, is only one of the first pages, again, that this, I believe, is copy, copy C. Um, if we go to the next slide, there we have a very different take on the frontispiece that we've been looking at, a different color palette, and we have a, a, a different facing plate with a very familiar lyric in it. And what difference does it make to juxtapose this plate to the frontispiece to have this following it rather than the one we saw before? It poses a lot of questions, really, doesn't it? Uh, that there can be two completely different versions in this way. And we're used to different copies in Blake, but here we actually have a different, different text and a very different visual impact. Jason. Just to mute myself first. Um, so Blake's experimentation with books, I, I personally believe that in this particular instance, we're seeing something much simpler take place because the preface exists in copy A and I believe copy B. So the, the, the first two issues, um, prints that Blake makes, that he, he basically yanks it from the later versions. Um, it contrasts, for example, if, if you look at what it, Blake was doing with the Book of Eurism, where he is deliberate, you know, there are no two copies of Eurism which are the same. He is deliberately experimenting with the form of these kind of books of brass to subvert any kind of Eurizenic intention. I think one of the things, per my personal take on the preface is the fact that Blake pulls it from the later versions is he realises, I, I, and actually I'm not offering anything particularly astonishing here because this is very much the take of Essex and Biscayne in their edition of the, the poem. Basically, if you read the preface, Blake is appealing to an audience. 
So in 1804, he returns from Feltham, he starts to engrave this work, um, he has high hopes that, you know, he's, he, he's, he's going to enter a new phase of his creative and artistic productivity. And actually, we know with horrible, you know, the benefit of terrible hindsight, that he actually enters that dark decade where nobody's buying his work. He, he, he after the work with Chromec, there's, there's virtually no commercial work that Blake engages with for, for nearly 10 years. And so he, he's appealing to this audience that actually it's becoming increasingly clear does not exist. And, and I think one the, 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 the real tragedy for me for this particular preface, which I think is one of the best pieces of writing that Blake's ever engaged with. I mean, I've spent the past decade paying an awful lot of attention just to this one place. Um, he, he, he kind of, he has this incredibly lucid criticism. I mean, actually, that the, the first paragraph that, you know, the, the stolen perverted writings of Homer and Ovid, etc. Um, that, that, that this is one of the great examples of Blake as a lucid writer. He condenses in those, you know, those, those couple of hundred words, an incredible critique of Milton, which is essentially that Milton allowed himself to be corrupted, his writing, his art to be corrupted by this kind of classical vision of hero worship. And it's an astonishing piece of writing. It's incredibly cogent and thoughtful. And of course, it's followed by what becomes, what will become one of Blake's most famous lyrics. Um, and you know, he, he's starting to print these copies in 1811, and it's become increasingly clear that nobody's interested. You know, what Blake must have been going through during this period to have spent year after year creating these epic works, these incredibly detailed and profound visions, which nobody wanted to read. I mean, for me, the preface is one of the great tragedies of Blake's life. You know, he produces an astonishing piece of work, and then within the year has pulled it because it's an embarrassment to him. I mean, I very much relate this to the, um, the opening plates of Jerusalem where he gouges out references to readers, you know, lover of books, etc. that Blake is defacing his own work because the audience, he, he, this, this is the point where Blake is probably most alone in terms of his audience. You know, a few years later, he'll befriend Linnell and um, he'll start to be gather the Shoreham ancients around him. He will once again discover an audience that will sustain him in his later years. But at this particular moment when he's producing Milton a poem, there's nobody, you know, there, 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 there are very few people who are paying attention to Blake's work. And so for, on a personal level, I find actually that the, the removal of the preface is, is much simpler than, for example, the experimentation that's taken place during the, the, the period of the Lambeth prophecies, where Blake, Blake's still quite hopeful for his art form. He, he's, he's, he's innovative, he's engaging in, in, in incredible processes of deconstructing the book. And, and the terrible tragedy for me is that with the preface in Milton, it's just, it's, it's a personal slap in the face. It's mm. the realisation that he's writing these great works and nobody is reading them at that moment. Mm. So it, it's just, I, I, I find this one of the most poignant works in the entirety of Blake's outputs. You know, that, that I say that, that, that opening paragraph for me is one of the, I mean, it's completely changed the way I, I approach a whole host of literature and literary criticism. You know, it, it began a long process of incredibly critical reading of, of the influence of the classics on Western art for me. Mm. And it's just in a couple hundred words. It's an astonishing piece of writing, which you think if copy A and B had disappeared, we'd never have. It, it would have, it, it's so ephemeral in one sense. That's brilliant, Jason. Yeah, this is copy A in fact, isn't it? Um, yeah. And yes. um, it is an extraordinary piece of uh, polemic. I know what you mean yeah. about the gouged out bits. Uh, of Jerusalem. I think he described Milton to Crabbe Robinson as, as uh, being a classical atheist. <laughs> yeah, yes. And, uh, and obviously, uh, yeah, I was very critical of his military, uh, of his military, uh, well, his, I mean, yeah, I mean, his involvement with Cromwell's militarism. Yeah. But I think- I mean, that, this is, I'm sorry. Yeah. 
the whole poem is about sort great. of filtering those things out of Milton, isn't it? Uh, I, I just draw for everybody's attention, Bob, this is a great, the preface is fantastic to read alongside his very short work um, on Homer and on Virgil's poetry, which, which take the same theme and develop it. Again, incredibly condensed writing, yeah. but it's, it's an astonishing intellectual critique of a whole tradition of Western art. Yeah, yeah. I shall reread it with that very much in, in mind. I always find it extraordinary that the, the, the uh, what has become the hymn Jerusalem sits, sits there. And then I've, I've often um, on occasions um, taken a perverse pleasure um, in, in, in talking about this poem to then reading on. And, 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 and then we're very suddenly into Milton wandering in sexual delusions and... Uh, uh, and, and what follows is so, you know, untoward in terms of the familiarity of something that is often described as the second national anthem. Um, we have Jennifer w Gates. Yeah. Sorry. Oh, sorry. I was sorry, just going to I... say, W.B. Yeats actually interpreted it in very sexual terms in the 1893 edition of um, the works of Blake. Yes. <laughs> and it's a really bizarre reading where you know, sort of arrows of desire are read oh. literally by Yeats. <laughs> yes, yes. I suppose it's a bit uh, Saint Sebastian, potentially, <laughs> if you're looking at it that way. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Jason. Jennifer Jesse has had her hand up for quite a while. Jennifer. Yeah, uh, I'm just looking at this from a visual perspective. I mean, you can't help but be struck by the almost colorless nature of this frontispiece against the truly beautiful. Uh, colors of the preface. And I'm, I'm just so intrigued by Diane's question, why, why would Blake use this white line technique? Why, especially given the fact that it was so difficult to achieve? I would love to hear if, if people have ideas about, about that. Why? Jason's back. Um, I want to make actually, I'd, I'd really recommend Joe Viscomi's most recent book on Blake's painted printing. So this isn't about this particular text, it's about the large colour prints, so, you know, um, Newton, the most famous one. And, uh, but but the, there is a couple of chapters in which Joe Viscomi is really compelling, in my opinion, of just drawing attention to how inventive Blake was as a printer, but that one of Blake's problems as it were for his contemporary audience is Blake couldn't stop experimenting that that unlike most of his contemporaries who um engraving particularly intaglio engraving was, was a means to end it, it was a means to reproduce you know oil paintings etc that that in Blake what we have is one of the world's great printmakers because he genuinely constantly experiments with the material form Oh, so the author is, is Joseph Viscomi, and, and I've got it somewhere around the house. Oh, <laughs> my books are in a bit of a mess at the moment. But it's, 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 I think it's something like Blake's painted, printed paintings, and it's a discussion of the um, large colour prints. It's a, it's a great book. I, I, I have, have immense time for, for Joe Viscomi's work on, on Blake as a visual artist. Um, and, and also, actually, Joe's particularly useful in... For literary, you know, people such as myself who come from a liter literature background, you know, we started off doing English literature and then gone into Blake. Um, he's very good at slapping us down a little bit and saying, stop trying to interpret Blake's paintings, Blake's images in terms of Blake's writing. Sometimes Blake is an artist first and is interested in the visual iconography first, which is an entirely different ar argument. But, but in terms of this kind of white relief, white line relief etching, I think it's part of, um, it's something that Blake starts in the 1790s and continues to the 19th century, that Blake is a genuinely experimental printmaker. He's constantly looking for new ways to, um, to, to, to push the medium. Uh, and that we don't, you know, I say we, we, I think members of the Blake Society will recognise this immediately. But a lot of art historians just don't recognise how truly innovative Blake was as a craftsman. Um, as an individual experimenting with materials as well as form. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jason. Yeah, I think sometimes the um, the artwork and the text are very much contraries 
uh, in that sense. They're not uh, they're not illustrations to anything. Um, it's it's. Stephen Noel Chevalier had his hand up. I know, and he's making a remark. I think about death door. Please put it down again. But no, please speak to us. Yes. No, I was just going to point out that the um, that that very experimental uh, death door, uh, very striking piece that he submitted uh, for the grave, and it was, you know, I mean, the story is that it was so shocking and so uncommercial that that Cromack, you know, completely rejected it out of hand, and he's. You know that that kind of experimentation is going on here, and it was around like the grave was eighteen oh nine, wasn't it? That that grave project. So he's doing yeah. this stuff around the same time. Yes, and also some some of the preparation preparatory drawings for the grave were earlier, so there would have been almost overlap between these two. Um, this period of um, his work. Yeah. Wondrous. Are there any more comments on this plate? I'm very aware that we won't get through uh, all the full page plates that, uh, that we've got lined up here. Um, but perhaps we can go to the next one, which is very, very different and very dynamic. So this is, uh, this goes with the Bard song and um, it's thought to be um, Palamabron, Rintra, and Satan, who uh, some critics certainly map on to um, and uh, they cause havoc by exchanging exchanging places. Satan is, <laughs> Satan is, I'm just laughing at Jason's comment, um, Rintra on the dance floor, showing his moves, is I think what he's saying there. It's very much like that. He's really <clears throat> giving it some go, some gove, one might say. So much more impressive, perhaps, than Michael Gove. Um, it's figure in the foreground is thought to be Satan. He's wringing his hands. But that, that very Blakean notion of Satan, pity dividing the soul, Palamabron on the left looking rather mild, and Rintra um, expressing, his, expressing his rage. Um, this, of course, is about Haley. Yeah, it starts well with Haley. Haley's attempt to get Blake a reasonable living at the expense of vision. Another trio that maps onto this. It's often thought to be Blake, Haley, and, and Milton. Again, it's the business of being, being in the wrong role. Satan wants to drive mild Palama bronze harrow while he tends Satan, Satan's mills. Rintra, the wrathful, drives the plow. These, these are cosmic tasks, the great apocalyptic part of the great apocalyptic harvest. And we saw on the uh, on the first page, the, the, the harvest and the vintage prefigured. Satan is later revealed to be Eurizen, drawn down into generation by the um, by Orc and the shadowy female. Eurizen too, of course, usurps another's place and causes chaos. And the Zoas are very specifically in this in this poem. One thing that um, that I only noticed relatively recently when we were putting together our uh, our Blake. Uh, show and performance, Albion Awake, is a, a letter that Blake writes from Felpham and says, work will go on here with God's speed. A, a roller and two harrows lie before my window. I met a plough on my first going out at my gate the first morning after my arrival, and the ploughboy said to the ploughman, Father, the gate is open. And it's very interesting that he's in Felpham, it's the first day, and he refers to the plough and the harrow. And when he comes to, to put Milton together, there we have a tale that very much centres around, or the bard song, around the business of the plough and the harrow. And the gate being open, he sees as, uh, I think, well, it's very much like 
like um, he, he sees it as being open, doesn't he, Falcon, to uh, the spiritual, her golden gates, her windows are not obstructed by vapours, voices of celestial inhabitants are more distinctly heard and their forms more distinctly seen. And now begins a new life because another covering of earth is shaken off. You're all welcome beneath our thatched roof of rusted gold. Um, and if anybody wants to jump in on this, do so. Otherwise, I will scroll through because I want to arrive at the cottage because we're going to talk about the cottage at the end. If we can have the next slide, Ian. This um, is the plate I was referring to where Milton wrestles with Eurizen. He gives life and Eurizen gives death. There are the, uh, the stones of the commandments, presumably in Milton's hands. And look at Milton's uh, right foot there. He's breaking selfhood in two. Um, and that, of course, is what Blake has Milton do in this poem. He breaks um, his selfhood apart. He, he, he releases his, his self from its hood, effectively, its covering. Um, uh, and Milton acknowledges Satan and the, the spectre in himself. And in order to reclaim his emanation, he has to uh, he has to recognize his spectral part. And he talks about annihilating the selfhood, but uh, it's as though you know, the the eternal can never be uh, extinguished. But it's about um, the selfish selfhood here that it's being split. And the figures at the top, very beautiful and reminiscent of um, figures in the. Um, in Blake's illustrations to the book of Job points with their instruments. If we could go to the next slide, please. I'm not seeing any hands, but the beautiful starfoot image. And there, as we say, we've got uh, Robert and William um, and Milton entering both their feet. So we've got, yeah, all these um, fusions going on. Milton enters both their feet uh, as though they were one. And Blake uses Robert's notebook and devises the printing method and is constantly advised by him. Two of my very favorites. I've taken these from um, another copy because I can't, I can't quite cope with the diaphanous swimming trunks that are in copy C. Um, I haven't, I'm not going to show you those because I find them really upsetting. Um, but here we have the, more of the naked form displayed. And then, uh, yeah, it's just fantastic. And it's the, the left foot of William and the right foot of Robert. And of course, there's a lot of theories around um, right brain, left brain, different sides of the body, but we won't go there. Um, and the black cloud redounds over Europe, doesn't it? Um, as, as effectively, it's almost as though Blake filters Milton through his body and, and takes out some of the things that, that he doesn't like. Ramazan. I think these are two of uh, Blake's most powerful paintings because uh, the spiritual um, connection he feels towards Robert is incredible. We can see it uh, in these pictures. Uh, I was fascinated to read that um, the stars are falling on the tarsus of their feet, mm -hmm. yeah. which is a reference to uh, St. Paul, I guess. Paul of Tarsus at Ramazan, yeah, yeah, on the revelation. In Turkey, so <laughs> that's what fascinated me, first of all. Um, but I wonder uh, what the stairs behind them uh, are referring to where are they leading yeah where are they coming from rather sure. all this happens um according to one part of the poem in the garden uh, you know milton descends and blake swoons and falls onto his path i i feel there's a rather again rather theatrical staging to this um which i referred to earlier the steps are introduced i think this uh 
perhaps that relates to what Jason was taking, uh, what Jacob was saying, Jason was saying about uh, the pictures being pictures. It, um, it, it seems to me it's, uh, it, it gives it a, just a sense of, of wonderful staging. It's certainly not contextualized in the garden where it, it happens um, in terms of Milton's descent, but then things in this poem happen uh, more than once and are seen from different perspectives. These are visionary forms, dramatic as David Erdman would say. Yes, yeah, and I've, I've been very struck by the dramatic nature of, um, of a lot of Blake's drawings in that way, and they do, they do stage uh, extremely well when an actor actually embodies them, um, as, as we've done in the, in the piece we've put together. I think if we scroll on, Tim, and we'll get to that. This is Milton's track. We see the four zoas and the cosmic egg created by Loos. I love the fact that we've got a map of this, the diagram. It's fantastic. And the track comes right in. And we've got Adam as the limit of contraction and Satan as the limit of opacity and wonderful, beautiful colored flames coming out. But I'm not gonna dwell on this. Um, next slide, please. We, are, we will get to, this is um, Los appearing to him. And of course he says that Los has uh, carried him uh, Los behind me stood a terrible flaming sun just close behind my back. Um, and he says that uh, well, when Los joined with me, another fusion, he took me in his fiery whirlwind. My vegetative portion was, my vegetative portion was hurried from Lambeth shades. He set me down in Felpham's Vale and prepared a beautiful cottage for me that I, that in three years I might write all these visions that the children of Jerusalem may be saved from slavery. And that's where we're going. Next slide, please. And there we are at the cottage and Olalon descends uh, in a wonderful tra trajectory in the form of a, of a 12 year old virgin. And Blake asks her to enter the cottage and, and comfort um, Catherine, who's sick with fatigue. And of course she was very ill at this time, a rheumatism, it didn't suit her. And as things went on and things got bad in Felpham before Schofield enters the garden, um, it's, it's already going very downhill. And obviously the relationship with Haley, but from Blake's side, he perceives it as uh, having gone terribly wrong and he's having to compromise as he sees it, his vision. Um, if we go to the next slide, we'll get a nice detail on that. And this um, really takes us in. We can see the sea in the, in the background and um, it's just a gorgeous image kindly labelled for us as Blake's, Blake's cottage in, in Felpham. And it's what these days they call geopoetry. It's all, it's all very much uh, located in this space. And Blake is depicting himself in the garden. And uh, it's, all, it's all come together in, uh, in the beautiful garden. If we move on, there is Blake's cottage, uh, my own photograph, when we went there to, to film the opening for, um, for our stage play of Blake's time in Felpham from 1800 to 1803. And uh, yeah, Tim, would you like to take it on? Uh, if we'd, and Jonathan, if we're talking about the cottage now. Thank you, Stephen, and thank you everyone for those insights into Milton. Sometimes the most obvious things you forget, and I like very much Diane Eagle's reminder that um, the blindness of Milton, you, you forget sometimes when you see the visual artist Blake interpreting that, and that was a wonderful reminder. So, Blake's Cottage. 
Another extraordinary thing, he stayed there for just three years and when he drew it, he gave his name to the cottage. It's Blake's cottage, it's outrageous. He appropriates this building. And equally with Olalon, you are invited into his cottage. And for many years, the Blake community has been trying to acquire the cottage. This story goes back um, 20 years and more. And we succeeded a few years ago to acquire the cottage and to put it into trust. And we are now moving to the next stage, which is the renovation and moving towards the opening of this building to the public. With all things with Blake, it takes time. And we're aiming at the significant year of 2027, the anniversary of um, Blake's death. And we're doing it in various stages. Jonathan, are you, are you present? Yes, yes, I'm here, Tim. Would you like to say a few words? Um, yes, as Tim said, we're moving on to the next stage. Uh, I've come in fairly recently as a trustee of the Blake Cottage Trust. Uh, I'm now secretary of the trust and also secretary of the Blake Society. Uh, but I'm putting quite a lot of my efforts at the moment into the cottage. Uh, we've had a lot of discussions with Historic England, the government body responsible for um, historic buildings and archaeology in general. And uh, they're going to declare the building uh, on the Heritage at Risk Register, which will be published in November, so next month. Now that may sound like a bad thing that um, we've got a property that's at risk, but there's a lot of uh, reasons for having a property at risk, uh, not least uh, an, a property being unoccupied, which is one of the concerns that we've got with the cottage. Uh, we've also got the roof to rethatch. Uh, there are um, roof timbers to replace. So it, it, can, it could be, uh, considered at risk, but it's going on the official Heritage at Risk Register uh, in November. Uh, that'll be English Heritage, uh, Historic England's um, annual uh, update of the register. And while that may seem a very negative thing, being on the Heritage at Risk Register actually opens up a lot of grant aid opportunities. So there's lots of pocket pots of grant aid that you can't actually apply for unless you've got a building that's at risk or theoretically at risk on the register. So uh, you might see some publicity about the cottage, hopefully, and the fact that it's at risk, but I wouldn't worry too much about that. It's not going to fall down. It's to some extent a, uh, a technical analysis of the state of a building rather than necessarily um, a building that is, I say, going to fall down. Uh, we're going to take the opportunity of the publicity around uh, the register being launched, the annual update of the register, to start a fundraising um, program for the cottage. As Tim said, to get it um, into a state where we can open it for the 200th anniversary of Blake's death in 2027. So <clears throat> we're looking for partners. We're looking for people that want to help us on that journey in terms of both the funding and publicising uh, the need for the funding for the cottage. Publicity from um, members of the Blake Society is going to be really important if we can just spread the message. But we'll, as I say, we'll be doing two things. We'll be applying for grant aid because it's a heritage at risk property. And we'll also be uh, asking the public for donations as well through uh, quite a big publicity campaign, we hope. Historic England will be putting out their press release uh, at the beginning of next month. And we'll have a complimentary press release going out as well. Uh, we've done a lot of thought as trustees about whether we should just go for the cottage uh, restoration or whether we should go for the bigger picture, uh, which was uh, explained and publicised some years ago with a new building next to it, um, the uh, 1960s, well, 1930s and 1960s um, additions removed so the cottage stands proud again uh, and stands alone and um, separate from everything else and that's our plan we're going for the, the big prize really which is not only the cottage restored but also 
the Blake Gallery next to it, which is a, an art space, a display space, and an activity space. So we're being bold here. Uh, I'm sure Blake would have liked us to be bold, but we're, we're going to be bold and we're going to take it forward uh, over the next few years. Um, that's about it from me, really, Tim. I don't know if you want to come in again about uh, from your perspective, but I'm pushing forward quite heavily now and spending quite a lot of time with the other trustees to get a business plan together, get grant applications in, and uh, generally move the whole project forward. We're on the next stage now. We've secured the property as trustees, and now it's the renovation and the creation of a new build gallery. Thank you, Jonathan. I would only add that Historic England, we asked them to put the property on the at-risk register because in some sense, Blake is at risk in our culture. We've heard tonight the extraordinary virtuosity of Blake as a printer, his work as an artist, his work as a poet, his work as a critique of other forms of literature. And um, the challenge we face in raising what is, in terms of national budgets, a tiny amount of money is extraordinary because Blake is at some sense at risk in our culture. But through the way we're approaching it, um, steadfastly and valiantly, we will get there. And so thank you everyone for your support of this project, which grew out of the Blake Society into the Blake Cottage Trust. And we will keep you informed of, of how it advances. Ian, can we see Blake's garden where Milton landed? It's a profoundly beautiful place. And uh, I can only uh, echo Tim and Jonathan's uh, sentiments that it is, uh, it's an incredible uh, thing that Blake's cottage where he spent those three years, which was so crucial in the creation of some of the most important of his work, um, is there has been preserved and, and now needs our help. And uh, if you haven't been to Blake's Cottage, it's a very, I find a profoundly moving experience to be there and to be where Blake and Catherine were and where this extraordinary work was done. And final slide, please, Ian. And this is how Blake's been commemorated in the local church in Felpham, which would of course have been a lot better had Blake done these himself, but it does commemorate some of his words and his image of the cottage. So thank you everybody. And it's been an extraordinary uh, session. I'm sorry we had to move so fast through uh, Milton, but I think it was very important that we got so much out of the initial images and the frontispiece. This was, after all, about the frontispiece. Um, uh, and the contributions were fantastic, um, as ever. So do think about joining the Blake Society and do give your full support to the fundraising for Blake's Cottage. Uh, I certainly intend to. Thank you very much. Everyone, our thanks to Stephen for leading this evening's event. And we will see you at our next event next month in November, which will be the birthday and the launch of the second issue of Baylor, the journal or the magazine of the Blake Society. So thank you all for contributing and we'll see you soon. Good night, everyone.